Even though I spent nearly an hour on it last time, I had some more thoughts regarding this whole lat thing. Um, some of what I'm going to put up is just to hopefully make things a little bit clearer, since I think my descriptions needed images. Um, but I also want to address another part of the lats that I think is getting ignored in this entire discussion. Before I get started, I want to make uh, another um, public apology to the guys at N1. Uh, XM uh, made me aware that I had misrepresented what they were saying in this regard. And I certainly don't like being misrepresented, as so many do, because they're illiterates or they're Mike Isertail, Isertail who just likes to tell flat-out lies. And I don't like misrepresenting other people. The difference is that, unlike these others, I own my mistakes. So, Sam, guys did one. I do apologize. In the future, I will do better due diligence so that I'm not talking completely out of my ass. Let me add to that that I don't care if I misrepresented Paul Carter, because I give exactly three-fifths of a fuck with that roided out macho hillbilly moron thinks about anything. However, I will make sure through the rest of this video to tread lightly, son. Jesus Christ, you're a joke. All right, let's get to it. All right, so last time I went into this idea or this belief or this something that um, that the lats have zero leverage above 120 degrees of shoulder flexion. And again, we are talking about flexion in this plane only right now, right? So flexion, flexion actually if you go overhead, extension, hyperextension. We're not talking about this movement in the scapular plane. We're not talking about this movement in the frontal plane. We're not talking about external rotation, internal rotation per se. We are talking solely about flexion. And the idea was that, okay, that's 90, that's about 120, thereabouts, um, that based on a single paper with some severe limitations that I brought up, the lats have no leverage except for a small bit in the inferior portion of the lat. So, the, what, what I talked about was in that study, they did a cadaver study, they measure what's called a lever arm, and I tried to describe what that is, and I want to do it again, briefly, with some images. All right, so, forces are linear, right? Gravity is a force, it pulls straight down, your muscles generate a force, they pull at some angle, like if here's your... Here's your upper arm, and here's your forearm, and your biceps kind of run like this. Your biceps pull here. That's a linear force. Okay, now, all joints in the human body move rotationally. The human body translates rotational movement into linear movement, right? So when you're walking, your hips are swinging and rotating. Your knee is swinging and rotating. Your calf is rotating at the ankle. Those rotational movements get translated into linear movements. Now, a torque, which is really the term I should have been using, torques occur around an axis of rotation, right? So here's an image. All right, so the center of that big blue circle is the axis of rotation, right? Think of that like, like say you're trying to tighten a bolt or, uh, or something like that, something that needs to spin to lock down. Um, F1 and F2 are forces. All right, so imagine that that blue circle is a bolt, right? And I've got my wrench, and I'm going to put on, attach to it, F1 and F2 in that picture are the force downward. F1 is out here, F2 is closer in because I've got a shorter wrench. So the resultant torque, which will be the rotational force that's put on that bolt to either loosen or tighten it, will be given F1, times m1, right, where torque 1 is going to equal to f1, the force I'm putting at the end of the wrench, times m1, the lever arm. Torque is the resultant rotational force that will rotate here. But same token, torque 2 is f2 times m2. The take home of this is that the length of the lever arm determines the total torque. So whatever at the bottom is, let's say F1 and F2 are the same, right? I'm holding a wrench. I am putting 
10 units of force downwards. At the longer lever arm at M1, the resultant torque will be much higher than if I'm much closer. And anyone that's ever screwed on or screwed off a bolt knows the longer your wrench, the easier it is. And that's because of what this torque relationship is, right? For the same downward force, a longer lever arm will provide a higher torque. So what I wrote at the bottom is that if F1 equals F2, then torque one will be greater than torque two because M1, the lever arm, is greater than M2. So, right, so with the same force, I will get a greater torque by having lever arms, a bit larger lever arm. By the same token, for a larger lever arm, I can get the same torque with less force. Right? Again, that's why tiny short wrench, a lot of force. Long wrench, same force generates a lot more torque. And if you get one of those big giant plumber's wrenches, you can really generate and you use that when things are locked. You've got to tighten them up. Okay, so that's what we're talking about. Right, because again, we've got a, a joint axis and we've got a muscle attachment, in this case the lats. The lever arm is here, and again, the lever arm is defined as, or the moment arm, the perpendicular distance between the line of force and the axis of rotation. All right, let's move on. All right, so that's a general principle of what we're talking about, right? The shorter the lever arm, the less torque you get for a given amount of force. And the longer the lever arm, the larger torque you get for a given amount of force. By that, obviously, if the lever arm goes to zero, the amount of torque you can get is zero, because any number times zero is zero, right? And that's what was at issue here, is that in the paper that Chris Beardsley presented, in Chris Beardsley's article, when you looked at this paper by Ackland et al., it showed that the lever arm went to zero at a shoulder flexion of 120 degrees. Hence, there can be no net torque, which by definition means that the lats presumably can't have any action upon the upper arm. Zero torque equals zero force equals it cannot be what's causing the upper arm to move at that part of the, at that joint angle of the exercise by mathematical definition. So that's kind of what this was about. So when we're talking about exercise or movement, or in this case, lifting weights, we've actually got two torques to deal with. One is the torque generated by the resistance. Okay, now I'm gonna focus on free weights because with free weights, the resistance is always straight down because it's due to gravity. Gravity points down. This is why holding dumbbells, standing up and doing this or doing flies doesn't do anything. Gravity points down and the pecs are firing horizontally. It's a great front delt exercise to hold them up. Gravity points down. Right now, if you use tubing cables, this can you can change this, but this is just to keep it simple. Gravity points down. So the force of the weight with a free weight will always be straight down. The resultant torque will depend on the distance from the axis of rotation. And as I said in the first part, this is why people, why biomechanics can affect things so much. If you have short arms, if you're doing a bicep curl, the shorter your arms, the shorter the lever arm for the weight you're holding. So the torque will be less. If you take two people, one with short arms and one with long arms, you both have them hold the exact same weight. One with the longer arms will have a longer moment arm at the elbow, right? And it's pulling down. So it's the weight is generating a torque downwards. That is what you're resisting. Now, in the case of a bicep curl, the biceps, right, attached to the forearm, right? Here, here's the upper arm. Here's the forearm, right, which is going to pivot around the elbow. And here's the biceps, which is going to pull this way. The lever of the biceps generates a torque upwards. Right? Gravity generates a torque downwards. It points down and is trying to rotate the forearm down. The biceps pull upwards and is trying to pull here when you do a curl. If the upward torque exceeds the downward torque, you can lift the weight. And if the downward torque exceeds the upwards torque, 
you can't, or you have to do an eccentric and lower the weight. Okay, does that make sense? I hope so. Um, presumably anyone watching this has lifted weights and kind of knows what I'm talking about. Now, one thing I did mention, I want to mention again, is that in most cases in the body, the where the muscle attaches to the bone is closer to the joint than where the weight is. All right, so again, upper arm, forearm, the weight goes out here, right? Here's the dumbbell. The bicep attaches much more closely, right? I'm terrible at this. Whatever, my next image will show it. There's a couple weird exceptions, but for the most part, the muscle attaches closer to the axis of rotation than the weight does. So the lever arm of the weight will always, almost always be longer than the lever arm of the muscle. But what I want to look at is how this is changing during a movement. I'm going to keep it simple. I'm going to show a bicep curl, right? Because if you're dealing with a squat, if you're dealing with a bench press, if you're dealing with any compound movement, you have multiple axes of rotation with multiple muscles contributing with their own lever arms, and shit gets complicated. So I'm going to stick with a single joint movement, or for all practical purposes, there's only rotation around the biceps. Yes, yes, you can curl your wrists. Yes, your shoulders can come up. The pedants just need to shut the fuck up about this. I'm trying to keep it simple. Focus on the concepts. All right, so here's my crappy image because I do my own graph design and I'm terrible at it. Okay, so what I've poorly shown in the, is this. On the leftmost image, I am showing the lever arm of the weight itself, right? That 10 is a 10 unit weight. 10 pounds, 10 kilos, 10 million pounds, it doesn't matter, right? At different points in the curl. Right, so position one is right at 90 degrees, right? It's a curl when you're right here, right? Position two is both here and here. And position one is towards the bottom and also here. Or position three, rather. And what you can see, right, so F sub G is force of gravity. Always goes straight down. So in position one, the lever arm I've drawn from the the red line, the red arrow down, over to where the axis of rotation would be. It's a perpendicular line. It's above that, like if the, the, the little clear blue circle is supposed to be the elbow, and I didn't want to overlap them, like actually it would, the, the, the lever arm would run directly across the forearm in this case, but then you wouldn't be able to see it. All right, so it's longest. That's why bicep curl is hardest in the middle. In position two, both the top and the bottom, and what I did is I drew the line and I flipped it horizontally to make sure it's at the same angle, right? That's a magenta line, right? Again, gravity points down. And you can see that that magenta line drawn again to where the axis of rotation would be uh, is now shorter, right? And then finally, the green line, when the weight is either near the very starting position or at the very top, the green line is shortest. All right, so for the same weight in your hand, the torque will be the highest at 90 degrees. It will be less at whatever position two is and the least of all at position three. Think a bit about doing a bicep curl, right? You got dumbbell, barbell in your hands. Starts off easy, gets harder. This is the hardest bit. This is the sticking point. And then it starts to taper off and get easier again because of how the lever arm is changing from shortest almost close to zero. Like the weight, if the weight is hanging vertically, the lever arm at the elbow is essentially zero. It's a little bit longer, a little bit longer. Again, the weight here, longest, shortens, shortens. And if you could get it to the complete vertical, which thing is here my shoulder is, I mean, you don't ever get to quite complete vertical uh, at the top. But again, lever arm shortens um, again at the very top, which is why it starts easy, gets a little bit harder, hardest. Then it starts to taper off and gets you can hold the top without much effort. Again, we're talking about dumbbells here. Cables, tubing, stuff like that changes this. Let's keep it simple. Now, the right-hand side is almost incomprehensible because, again, my drawing skills suck. I'm a physiologist, not an artist. But what I've tried to show here is what the lever arm on the biceps is doing. Right, and there are, so I've drawn, I've drawn the arm at four positions. I tried to kind of mimic what was in the left side. It's not perfect, but it doesn't really matter. All right, so look at the, the, the very lowermost position of the curl. Okay, sorry, let's look at perpendicular, right? That is uh, 
I've drawn the biceps as a red line. And if you're wondering what that little square is, that was so I could uh, put the biceps in the same place on each line to try to keep this as accurate as possible. So if you look at the red line, right, the biceps is now going to be furthest away from the elbow. And the red axis of rotation, which you really can't see very well, shows that. Okay, when you're above the horizontal, which is the green line, the lever arm of the biceps is a little bit shorter because the forearm has moved closer. Remember, perpendicular distance. By the same token, at the first position below the horizontal, which is the magenta line, the lever arm is shorter still. Or actually, it's, it's, a, it's close to the, the position uh, above the horizontal. Again, I tried to flip those to keep them the same. But then at the, the lowest position, which is the yellow line, it's the shortest lever arm. Now, because I'm me, I find this really interesting, is that, in general, the lever arm of the muscles changes in concert with the lever arm of the resistance. All right, so think about, again, a bicep curl. The very bottom, lever arm on the weight, right, weight in my hand, is the lowest. But so is the lever arm of my biceps, because it's closest to the elbow. Here, lever arm of the weight gets longer but so does the lever arm of my biceps. At this position, where the lever arm of the weight is greatest, the lever arm of my biceps is also greatest, and then it falls off and falls off again. This is not universally true. You get into strength curves, not getting into it. That's why I kept it simple like this. There's even an additional factor that combines uh, contributes to this, which has to do with how muscles generate force at different lengths. All right, so we've got our muscle fibers, and they're overlapped, right? They generate force by contracting. Now, when they're very far apart, they don't generate force as well because they're not overlapped as well. In the middle, they generate force the best, and when they're in the shortened position, they get, they get so jammed up they don't generate force the best. If you get bored, go look at something called the uh, length tension relationship. And again, what you tend to see is that that is changing along with the movement. All right, so let's go back to the bicep curl. At the bottom, lever arm of the weight is the lowest. Lever arm of the bicep is the lowest. The bicep is at its longest length, so it can generate the least force. In the middle, lever arm of the weight is the longest. Lever arm of the bicep is the longest. But we're in a mid-range position, so the biceps can generate the greatest amount of force. And then as we go up, same thing. Lever arm of the weight drops, lever of the bicep drops. Force production capa capacity of the biceps drops because the fibers are now too jammed up. It's almost like the human body evolved like this. Anyway, this is just a bunch of technical shit that doesn't really matter, except that hopefully it will make the actual findings of both acclinodol and cucleodol a little bit clearer. So let's move on to them again. So in that previous video, I talked about two studies, right? One of them was by Ackland et al., and is the one that Chris Beardsley seemed to be basing, uh, or was basing his, his conclusions on, um, in terms of what was happening to the lever arms at different degrees of shoulder extension. Again, shoulder extension, shoulder extension only in this, this plane. But the review paper that he cited on this showed um, two curves and showed a second paper by Kukle et al. And here's the data from that again real quickly. And as I talked about, as I talked about, what you see is that, yes, that, that upper, the upper line, the dark black line, that was from, sorry, dark black line is from Acklin et al. And that does show the way the lever arms uh, as a whole and the lats are changing. Um, you know, from 15 degrees of flexion to 120, and you can see that, yeah, it does go to zero. But that light gray line, that's the data from Kukle et al., showing, unfortunately, they only measured 80 degrees of flexion. But you can also see that the slopes of the lines are almost identical. So to try to show this, uh, I made another image. So here it is. 
So what I did here is on the left picture, I tried to sort of mimic the slope of the Ackland data with that red line. And then over on the right, I just superimposed it on top of the Kukle data. And like I said, the, the first 75 degrees, the slope is effectively identical. And then even at 120 degrees, Kukle shows uh, a lever arm of um, uh, right about 30 millimeters. So it does go down, but it's still significantly higher than the Acklin data. And as I talked about in that last video, a lot of that comes down to the differences in the methodology of the papers. But clearly, I think that's worth looking at. But I fear that my verbal descriptions were not, uh, were not clear enough to really illustrate the differences in the two papers. Um, which is part of why I made this second video, because I want to make it a little bit, a little bit clearer. So both studies really did roughly the same things. They took basically a hunk of shoulder and attached this big metal thing, and then they ran wires to sort of approximate the lever arms, but they did it in two very different ways. And I've shown, I've shown this in, in the next image. So that left image is what Ackland et al. did, right? And so what they did was they took they estimated the lever arm for the different portions of the lats, right? Like the lats is a single muscle, but you can see in this that it, it has slightly different lines of pull, right? The, right, so the, the inferior portion of the lats is, is the most vertical, and then the medial portion of the lats is a, a little bit more horizontal and angled, and then the superior portion of the lats is, is the most horizontal, right? But all three, and then all three of them attach via the same tendon to the, the upper arm, the humerus. The other funny bone. Yes, I love that joke. All right, so what I did in that left image is so that the little blue circle, that's my estimated axis of rotation of, of the shore, right? And it, I, I didn't pick, I just picked a place. And the little rectangle, that was where I tried to the, do the attachments. So, so I could be consistent between pictures. All right, so you can see in that left picture, right, you've got the, the inferior latissimus dorsi. That's the blue line kind of pulling up here. And I drew that through the rectangle, and I drew the lever arm. And then the green line is the medial, the medial lat, which pulls a little bit more horizontally. And I drew that up through the same attachment and drew that the green lever arm. And then the red was the, the superior part of latissimus dorsi, which is almost the most horizontal, and drew that up through the, the uh, attachment, and then drew the lever arm. And you can see, hopefully, the little perpendicular lines for, you know, blue, green, and red. So what they were doing is they were estimating the lever arm for each of the segments of the muscle throughout that range of motion. So what I did in this image is first I took that the same blue, green, red arrowed lines from the left image and I just moved them straight over, right? So those indicate the, 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 the essential lines of pull of, of the different parts of the lat, superior, medial, and the inferior. And then the red line with no arrow is kind of what they did. They attempted to estimate the centroid of the muscle rather than the centroid of the individual sections. And basically what you get, if you remember vector math from high school, uh, is kind of this, this summed line of pull. So basically you take the three different directions of forces and you determine the magnitude of the force and then you add these together and use a bunch of math that I couldn't remember if my uh, career depended on it, which I guess it kind of does. Uh, that's what textbooks are for. And then you end up with this single vector and that's essentially what they were doing with that unarrowed red line. So again, the uh, blue circle, that's shoulder axis for rotation, exactly the same as in the first picture. I just pasted it over. Same thing with the attachment. want to keep those consistent. There's a little red perpendicular line that maybe you can see. Um, and and that's what Kukle did. One line of pull, one moment arm, which was like 30 centimeters higher than the Ackland data. All right, so if you actually sat through my previous video, remember the Kukle paper was earlier than the Ackland paper. And in their discussion, the Ackland paper talked about how they felt that their method with using uh, the three individual wires to calculate three individual lever arms was probably more accurate than, than Kukle that just used the one. And they're probably correct in a purely anatomical sense. Or, right, if you're just looking at this in very much isolation. But here's the thing. The lats don't fire in isolation. Now, if you think I'm wrong, if you know how to activate your superior lats without the medial or inferior firing, 
please send me a video because I want to see it. And I won't expect one because it can't be done. That's not how muscles fire. When the lats fire, they fire all at once. And while they all do eventually connect to the same tendon, the same attachment on the humerus, they are all still pulling at one time. And I do think a very strong case can be made that the Kukle paper and the lever arm they calculated is more relevant in a functional sense or in a real world sense or in the world of actual exercise when we're looking at how muscles really work. Like I said, the Ackland data, I'm not throwing it out. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm not saying it's wrong. But what they did does not represent how muscles actually work in the body. It may very well be more accurate in a strictly anatomical sense. I'll reiterate, I think a very strong case can be made that the Kukle data, with vastly different lever arms, may be more relevant to real-world exercise in a functional sense. And let me mention again one thing about Backland paper, and probably the Kukle paper too. They only measure with the hands here. We know that, right, if I externally rotate my arm, it is, right, if here's the lat attachment. If I externally rotate, that changes the position. That change, even if I'm in the same plane, that changes the position. That's going to change the lever arm. They didn't take into account what's called glenohumeral translation. The humerus fits into the glenoid. As it rotates, it moves around. These were not accounted for. These occur in the real world. We don't get to ignore those. Again, I'm not saying the Ackland data is bad or wrong. We have to consider the limitations going from an isolated study examining individual portions of muscle that don't fire in isolation without looking at what happens in the real world. What if I'm doing a pull down here and if internally rotated? What if I'm doing a medium, an overhand grip where I have externally rotated? Well, although most of that's at the forearm. What if I'm doing a medium overhand grip pull down where now my elbows are no longer in this position? This would be a very weird movement. It can be done, but are here. So that now I'm moving towards the scapular plane. These occur in the real world. Ackland didn't test them. Drawing absolute conclusions seems premature to me. And yes, I use the British pronunciation. Bollocks. So in the active review paper that Chris Beardsley cited, it showed the lat as a whole, and it showed that everything went to roughly, essentially, 0 to 120 degrees, which is where this came from. But when you look at the, the original Ackland paper from 2008 that, that shows the individual data, it's not exactly the case. Um, the inferior portion of the lat maintains a small lever arm. One is about 0.7, and the other one uh, does go to 0. However... It's even a little bit more complicated than that. So what I've done is I've taken that one graph from the Acklin 2008 paper and focus on what's inside the red circle. So only focus on the, the top three lines, the lighter gray ones. All right, so the solid line, superior lat dorsi, clearly like it goes to zero at 120. No argument, right? The inferior lat dorsi, which is the um, thinner solid, the lighter solid gray line, right? You can see it certainly goes down. Um, and in the raw data, it shows it at 2.7 millimeters. And then the middle lat dorsi, which is the, the dash and dotted line, you see that it, it does seem to really hit a bottom point, but it actually hits 0 at 100. And then by my eyes, that line starts to come back up a little bit, right? Now, it's a, it's hard to see. I could be just miss eyeballing it. So why don't we then go look at the actual numerical data as the researchers presented? And uh, here's the image again. Same one that was in the, the first video. So this is the numerical data, and all you need to pay attention to is the, the two rightmost columns, right? And you don't the, the table uh, labels are, are off screen, but what they were showing was um, the smallest lever arm and at what angle of flexion it was reached. All right, so superior latissimus dorsi, it's a negative 0.1 moment arm, essentially zero, at 120 degrees, just as reported. The inferior latissimus dorsi hits its smallest lever arm at negative 2.9, again, at 120 degrees. No problem. That's exactly as Chris Beardsley reported it. 
but the middle latissimus dorsi actually hits its lowest lever arm, 0 0.7, at 98 degrees, which is what was shown in that previous image inside that red circle I drew. Now, they unfortunately didn't present the data for every joint angle, so I don't know what the, the lever arm was for the middle latissimus dorsi at 120. On the graph, it seems to come back up a little bit. Could be my old eyes lying to me. It still wouldn't come back up to much, right? I mean, it wasn't even zero at 98. Even if it came back up, you know, one and a half, it's still, it's not going to be much, it's not going to be big by any stretch, you know, no doubt about it. But for whatever weird reason, it may have hit its lowest value before 120 and then come back up. And I'd have to really sit and give myself a headache to try to figure out anatomically how that would work. And again, I don't think it's going to change much in terms of their data, but being the obsessive compulsive that I am, I thought it was worth mentioning. Before moving on, let me reiterate. The Ackland paper mentioned specifically that they estimated the axis of rotation of the shoulder. Now, not only does the axis of rotation move during movement, but if they misestimated it, it changed these numbers. Now you'll think, ah, oh, but how can it? How can it move that much? Okay, the values I just showed you are in millimeters. Go get a ruler or go look online, see how tiny a millimeter is. If the axis of rotation estimate they made is off, or if it changes, those values will change. And they will probably go up. Now again, I'm not saying they're going to get huge, but if the axis of rotation is off in their calculations by two millimeters, suddenly 0.1 effectively zero becomes two. That's not no leverage, which is what's being said. 0.7 becomes 2.7. Third one, set over two, becomes 4.7. Suddenly no leverage, which is what's being stated by some individuals, becomes some leverage. Again, it's not a big lever arm, but it's not a zero lever arm. And this also assumes that the Kukle data isn't the better numbers to use functionally anyway, in which case none of this matters because we're up in the 30 millimeter range. All right, now I'm going to move forward and look at some even more detailed stuff because in addition to everything I've talked about in terms of the limitation of the papers, the two different papers, the way the lats actually work, the fact that neither the Kukle nor the Ackland paper interpreted variables such as glenar humeral translation, internal external rotation, both of which impact where the attachment lies relative to the shoulder, which will impact the axis of rotation, which is actually what occurs in real world fucking movements. There's another factor that's being ignored. And for that, I have to bore you with a little bit of the anatomy of the shoulder girdle. So throughout this whole thing, and by that I mean in front of Chris Beardsley's article on how it's being interpreted, the focus has been on movement at the shoulder, which again is where the head of the humerus, other funny bone, starts in the glenoid fossa and moves. Now, and that's what Ackland examined, that's what Kukle examined as far as that data. Have you ever wondered why it's called the shoulder girdle? Well, the reason is that there are actually four joints that are involved in the shoulder girdle. All right, there's the glenohumeral joint, which is what we've been talking about. You've got the sternoclavicular joint, where the sternum attaches to the clavicle, which I don't care about. You've got the chromioclavicular joint, where the clavicle attaches to the acromion process. And there's a fourth one called the scapulothoracic joint. And that's what I want to talk about next. But before I can get to that, I'm going to bore you with a bunch of other stuff, but I'll try to be brief. All right, some quick anatomy. All right, anatomy is defined relevant to what's called anatomical position, right, which is here, which this has never felt anatomically really normal to me, but they were looking at cadavers. All right, everything is defined relative to the midline, and I'll bring that up because there's an issue that comes up. All right, so at the shoulder, flexion, extension, right? Flexion, extension, that's what we've been talking about. 
Now, people will go, ah, flexion, is that not extension, right? Because the midline runs up through my head. The answer is no, it's not. The midline is here, not through the head. Flexion, 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 extension, 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 hyperextension. Got it? Flexion, extension. In the frontal plane, we have abduction, AB, and again, as we go overhead, like when people do those go, go fast full lateral raises, abduction, 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 AD, adduction, adduction. And the way to remember that is you're adding to the midline. Adduction, adding, abduction, the other one. You can also get movement in what's called the scapular plane which is here. Again, we're focusing just on the shoulder right now. All right. External rotation, internal rotation, external rotation. Now, it, people will get confused. There's thing at the wrist. If I rotate the wrist and the palm, supination, which you remember because you're holding a cup of soup, pronation. But if you're turning at the shoulder, external rotation, internal rotation. With your arms up, horizontal adduction, right? Horizontal adduction, horizontal abduction, right? Adding to the midline, adduction. This is what happens in, say, a properly done cable crossover. The upper arm adducts in a bench press, right? The upper arm comes to the midline. And of course, you get all combinations of this, right? Uh, the shoulder is incredibly mobile. All right, so that's what's happening at the glenohumeral joint. And that's really what Chris was focusing on. Actually, that was all he was focusing on. I'll probably go back and look at his article and make sure. I already mentioned sternoclavicular joint, don't care. Chromioclavicular joint, don't care. But what is the scapulothoracic joint? Okay, the scapula are your shoulder blades. And thoracic refers to the, thro the thorax. Just think of it as your rib cage in the middle, right? Bugs have a thorax, but that's what it's called. All right. Here are your scapula. Right, so imagine you're, you're well, I'm looking at it from the back, so you're looking at it from, from the front. Don't worry, I'm going to demonstrate this on myself. Right, and they, they sit on top of the rib cage on the back here, right? So they can do a number of things. They can elevate. They can depress. They can protract where they come around the body, and they can retract when you pull your shoulder blades together. Now, you, you get slight rotations, like when they elevate, the, the inferior border will, will elevate a little bit, and when you depress, they come down a little bit. I'm, pro I'm exaggerating it, but so again, elevation, depression, protraction, retract. Let me try to show you this. Hopefully you can see it through, through my t-shirt. I'm in the right position. Okay, so you know, shoulder blades right here. All right, elevation, depression. Elevation, depression. I'm in a bench press or push-up position, protraction, I'm in a row, retraction. Protraction, retraction. Got it? Elevation, depression, protraction, retraction. And realize these can happen in concert, right? You can get retraction and elevation, right? So imagine you're doing like a, a, like a Yates row, right? You would get, just looking at the scapula, retraction and elevation. And then it comes, right? Retraction and elevation. If you're doing a push-up in sort of this position, you can get protraction and elevation, right? You had a high to low row, you could get retraction and depression, right? So you're getting these combined movements and that's just the scapula, right? So the scapula can come protracted and up, retracted and down, protracted and maybe down a little bit, depending on the movement. Now, here's where it gets really complicated. I realize it took me years to wrap my head around the shoulder.
The glenohumeral joint, the shoulder, can move independently of the scapula. The scapula can move independently of the glenohumeral joint. But under many situations, they move together. So let me give some examples. Let's say you're bench pressing, right? You get set up, get your shoulders packed behind you. It is pure movement at the shoulder, right? My shoulder blades are packed. It's only movement at the shoulder. And in this case, it's horizontal humeral adduction. Now, let's say I'm doing a push up. The bottom, shoulder blades are back. And at the top, my shoulder blades can move. And if you're familiar with physical therapy, this active protraction, it's called a plus. So if you go from rolled back to neutral, that's really a push up. And if you actively protract, that's the plus. But you can retract the shoulders <coughs> um, and get humeral movement you, without the scapula moving. By the same token, you can get scapular movement without humeral movement, right? So the easiest one to think of is a shrug, right? And a shrug, a shrug is pure scapular elevation. Nothing happens here. Nothing happens at the shoulder. I suppose if you did, like, if you do this, if you bend, if you bend at the elbows because it's too much weight, that's pure scapular elevation. Now, you can get pure scapular retraction. There's a movement called a shrug back. Um, that's a way to isolate the mid-back and take the arms out of it. So imagine you got a row, and all you did is that. Right? You let the shoulders roll forward into protraction, and you retract. And protract, and retract. You can do a shrug down, or a pull down, or a chin up. So imagine I'm holding onto a bar here, I let my shoulders elevate, and I just depress them without bending my arms. And I let them elevate, and I depress them. Another way to do that, imagine I'm on a dip, set of dip handles, right? I let gravity pull me into shoulder elevation, pure shoulder depression. Nothing is, ha sorry, pure scapular depression. Nothing is happening at the shoulder. So you can get pure movements of the humerus without the scapula. You can get pure movements of the scapula without the humerus moving. But in general, they tend to be coupled. And you will hear about something called scapulohumeral rhythm, which has to do with the way that the scapula moves in relationship to the humerus. Now, this actually was taken into account in both the Acklin and the Kukle papers. They were, since they had like a mechanical uh, scapula, they were moving that in, in the ratio that it normally moves relative to the humerus. So since I would invariably get it wrong, and this is what textbooks are for, I'm not going to try to get into the whole scapula humor rhythm thing, other than to say that in many movements, the movement at the glenohumeral joint and the scapula thoracic joint do occur at the same time. And this is especially true in thing, well, it depends. All right, so, gave a couple of examples. In a bench press, when you're locked behind, right, pack your shoulders for stability, you're getting movement at the humerus without the scapula moving. If you do a push-up, scapula move back, scapula move forward, right? And again, they should move in a certain ratio that doesn't matter. Um, same thing if you do like, you know, well, let's say you're doing a pec deck machine, right, with a back pad. You can pin, pin the scapula and do pure humeral adduction. However, if you're doing like a cable crossover, you're going to more likely get scapular movement just because it's very hard to pin them back. But let's talk about back movements because that's really what's going on here. All right, so what do people do when they're trying to lift too much on a row and their technique is shit? Right? They're here and they just go, ooh. Right? Their scapula don't, their shoulder blades don't move. And they go, oh, man, I get the worst pump in my arms. Yeah, because your technique sucks. 
right? To get the mid back during a row, you have to let your scapula roll forward without relaxing. You want to protract, and you as you pull with the arms, you hit retraction at the back, right? That's proper scapula humeral rhythm, right? Everything kind of locks at the same time from the back. Right, so again, shitty row, right? Watch my scapula. They don't move at all. Whereas in a proper row, scapula row forward into protraction. So pull back. Boom! I hit full scapula retraction as I hit the back part of the row. So here, we're seeing both move at the same time. It's the same thing in a lap pull down. Right? What do people do? Try to lift too much and pull down so you can't do chins or whatever well. Right? You see them get set up here and they just go, uh, right? To the side, all you see is uh. The shoulders just stay up. Uh. And the scapula don't move. What should be happening? Right? From a scapular elevated position. Again, you're not relaxing the shoulder, you're letting it elevate. The shoulders come down and back, and the scapula go from elevated, slightly rotated, and they come down and back from here. And again, the way I teach it, right, I want to see shoulders come down and everything hit at the same time at the bottom, right? And you'll see, like, there was, uh, okay, from the back, again, she pull down, shoulders are up, and they go, God, I get the best bicep pump. Yeah, because your form sucks. Whereas... Proper shoulders move down in the depression, and everything hits the same time. And you'll occasionally see people talk about, you know, doing a row and going, all right, set your shoulder blades first, and then just do that. Which can be done. I don't do it anymore. I will use, like, if I'm teaching rows, a lot of people have trouble figuring this out. I'll go shrug, shrug, row. Shrug, shrug, row. As a teaching tool. Because a lot of people, just when they're new to it, this doesn't make any sense to them. So you just go shrug, shrug, row. Same thing for pull down. If someone just can't, I'll have them go shrug, shrug, pull. Okay. Here's why this is important. Let's go back to anatomy. All right, so back to lat anatomy. So again, that's the main focus here. The lats attach three different parts, you know, of the spine. They have these different lines that pull. They attach the upper arm. They have a number of functions. Primary functions include shoulder extension, right? You're getting shoulder extension in a row. Shoulder extension, right? Adduction, if you're doing like a, a wide grip or a medium grip, elbows flared, pull down. A deduction, it's the primary function. They have a slight internal rotation function, not a huge one. Because of where they attach, they can slight, slightly involved in side bending. I, I don't think I've ever honestly seen anyone uh, really focus on that. Although now I bet I could come up with some goofy fuck lat exercise that involves lat flexion, or sorry, spinal flexion at the same time. One, one interesting bit though is actually the lats come in from the top and they attach to what's called the lumbodorsal fascia. It's the sheet of connective tissue, which then feeds into the glutes. Part of the reason that we tighten the lats on a squat or a deadlift is because through tightness through the glutes, it tightens the lumbodorsal fascia and gives more spinal support. There's your trivia for the day. The lats have another function, admittedly a secondary function, that's being ignored. Because the lats attach to the scapula. Today you learn. And as a, let me go back. Scapular elevation controlled by several muscles, traps, the levator scapulae, which literally means the elevator of the scapula, a couple of others. Protraction, serratus anterior, right? This is why therapists will use the plus to fix a dysfunctional serratus anterior. Great for scapular winging. Scapular retraction, it's going to say mid-back. It's like traps, two, three, 
Traps one pulls more up, so it's more elevation and retraction. Traps four, the lower portion. I've, I've seen three segments, I've seen four, I don't know what current thing will sort of retract, will, will retract and depress. Scapular depression, pec minor, serratus anterior, and a secondary muscle, or a secondary, another muscle that has a secondary function of scapular depression is the lats. Go look it up. Not making this up. Any basic anatomy site will mention this. Though as a super random piece of trivia when I was looking something up, apparently the lats don't attach to the scapula in all people. I don't know why, just one of those anatomical variations, but in the majority of them, the lats attach to the scapula. Again, it is a secondary function of the lat. It is an assister to other muscles, but almost no movements occur in isolation. But it sure seems to me like this is a function of the lats that's being ignored. And here's why it's important, and which is why I went into all that crap about the scapula thoracic joint. During a proper lat pulldown, regardless of grip, what do we teach people if we know what we're doing? We say, all right, or a chin up, it doesn't matter. Whether you're going up or the bar, weight bar is coming down, doesn't matter. We go, all right, the top position, let your shoulders elevate. Again, you're not relaxing. You don't want to let the shoulder, because then that just stretches the, the joint capsule. Let the shoulders elevate. And as you start to pull down, you set your lats and drop the scapula. Even on some types of rows, right? Like a high to low row, scapular elevated and protracted. And you set the scapula and they retract and depress. The lats are part of that. Again, working with the pec minor and serratus, probably a couple others. The Ackland Kukle paper didn't look at that. They used an artificial scapula that was moved manually. They didn't look at lever arms and scapula. They looked at lever arms estimated only at the shoulder joint, the glenohumeral joint. Are we just gonna ignore the other joint that the lat works at? Because that's what's being done because as there is movement of the scapula, as proper scapular depression is starting, even at the very initiation of the movement, even if the lats don't have the greatest lever arm, depending on which paper you want to use, at the humerus, and I still contend that while Ackland is probably the more anatomically correct, Kukle may be the more functionally correct, the lats are still firing to depress the scapula. So even if they had zero leverage to the shoulder, even if that was absolutely true for all three portions, it's not like they're not working. You can go test this for yourselves. Go find someone in the gym, hopefully a training partner. If it's not, find someone, ask them, make sure they're okay with being touched before you ever do this. And I want you to put your hands on their lats and have them do a shrug down. Just have them take a weight. Get into any sort of pull down position and do nothing but that. Where all they're doing is depressing the scapula, and letting them elevate. Just go do it. Go test it. Tell me what the lats do. The lats fire. Like I said that they are not a primary mover in this, but they are working. The scapula have a very different axis of rotation than the humerus. And yet everyone going on about the lats and what's going on at the shoulder seem to be ignoring the scapula. It's simplistic, and I realize it's great for trite Instagram memes, but that doesn't make it right. And it's not. So there you go. I think that's all I have to fucking say about the lats. So, um, next time, as a first of the year gift, I'm going to tell everybody who watches my videos the real thing that's destroying your gains. And it's not what you think it is. And I guess I should add, if you want to see me hopefully shit on the uh, perpetual stupid that is the fitness industry, like and subscribe. Or not, I don't really give a fuck. This is mainly just so I can piss and moan and yell at clouds, but see y'all next week.